Hi, Rudyard Griff is here, the Executive Director of The Hub. Welcome to this, a special edition, I guess, kind of, of our roundtable. We're convening Amanda Lang, uh, who's been joining us here at The Hub with some great insight and analysis on the business of government, as long as contributing regularly with Sean on uh, a series kind of looking at public policy developments as they relate to the economy on a biweekly basis. Sean Spear joins us, our editor at large. And we thought we'd have a debrief with Amanda on her series, The Business of Government. What did we learn? What are the key takeaways? This is a big topic as Canada kind of fights its way out of the effects of the pandemic, a reworking of government in our lives. Where's it all headed? Uh, well, let's go to Amanda Lang first. Amanda, this is kind of fun. We get to flip the tables, so to speak. Uh, Sean and I get to interview you, and I'm sure you'll be back at us with a few um, comments and thoughts of your own. But let's begin there, Amanda. I mean, great series, lots of different voices. I loved how you uh, wove together people inside government, economists outside government, um, you know, people deep in the civil service, you know, people at the, what we think of the pinnacle of government, premiers, uh, you know, people commanding the machinery of government, so to speak. If you had one big takeaway from the series, what would it be? You know, the thing, and I, so I would preface this answer by saying what I think we all wanted to do here was um, a, a kind of an unbiased, unjaded, like a, a sort of a blank slate approach. Um, so I came at it from that point of view and tried to get at, to your point, sort of the people who could give me that, the different lenses into government and how it functions. The, the thing I take away is actually a sense of optimism, if I can, if I can say that. I mean, I, I found that um, the, the folks that understand it the best on both the kind of bureaucracy side and on the political side, they see the problems, uh, they acknowledge the problems, but there is this sense of kind of shared belief that there's a lot of good people trying to do good work. Um, and then there was this constant through line that I think is really important for all of us to remember um, that we're doing okay in Canada. You know, we we do we, we do always try to elevate our game um, and complacency of course is the, the, the biggest enemy we can have. But that as, as governments are measured, we still stack up in the world. So as a starting point for the conversation, I think you could say, let's go from you know good to great, but we don't have to be too depressed about what's going on here. Maybe John, I'll why do you come in on this? Yeah, I'll just jump in. And, and Amanda, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about this. There's been you know really since the late 70s, early 1980s, a, a kind of ideological conflict about the size of government. And you had economist Livio De Matteo on for an episode to talk a bit about what the empirics tell us about uh, the optimal size of government in terms of um, maximizing um, the economy as well as addressing social needs. Um, but what's interesting, it seems to me in recent years is that that debate has shifted from uh, less of a focus on the size of government and, and more on the capacity and uh, abilities of the state. Um, and you know, mm -hmm. part of that, it seems to me, is a, a consequence of the fact that because of demographics, climate change, something you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, the rise of China and so on, government is probably going to be bigger, not smaller moving forward, um, just by the function of arithmetic in a way. Um, and so in that sense, talk a bit about the kind of evolution of that debate and the growing attention yeah. and focus on this idea of state capacity. Yeah, and I think this was one that it's super important not to get drawn into the partisan on this, right? Because it's so easy to go, you know, if you're on the right, you say small to zero government, and on the left, you want big government. I don't think that's true. I mean, I, I don't actually think if you drill into it, anybody wants a big government per se. Um, and the capacity question, Jason Kenney made this point excellently well, which is if you just use healthcare as an example of the difference between size and spending and capacity. We, nobody, everybody will nod their head. We get it. We spend so much on healthcare and it will only grow. And yet, are we delivering? Are we efficient? Are we getting the ends we want? And I think we can also all agree, lots of room for improvement. So um, I do think that's the place to look because the size, and again, you know, when we, with Livio, we talked about size um, in terms of program spending, which is the kind of the big nut. It's not the bureaucracy, of course, it's how we spend the tax dollars. And we didn't get into particularly because it's harder to measure in a comparative way um, size when you add in 
uh, regulatory reach um, or all the ways governments policy that that influences the economy, which is where you start to get closer to, you know, into the 70s, 80s percent of government reach into your economy. Um, and there's all kinds of good things about that. How it's done has to be, I think, our, our focus. Uh, and to me, that's that's you've kind of got to the most important question here, which is it's it, size. Yes, it does matter. Those are tax dollars. We should spend them wisely. How they're spent has to be the focus. Um, and I wish that that more of the conversation wasn't just, you know, a kind of a knee jerk how it's spent, but we actually dug into that. There's lots of and then, you know, the hubs healthcare um, competition is an example of how you can do it. Right. What's a simple policy fix for a hard problem? Let's do more of that. Mm hmm. Uh, Amanda, you know, coming out of COVID, there is an understanding, um, maybe with this particular government in Ottawa, a trend even before COVID, of significantly adding to government's uh, headcount. So you have mm -hmm. this idea of, you know, the teeth and the tail. So you have this, this fairly now large bureaucracy, arguably, you know, increased by almost a third over the last, you know, seven, eight years. Conversation about frustration about the delivery of services, the quality of services in Canada. I was struck, and I really urge listeners to go back because it's quite a, a, a get, so to speak, to have the former clerk of the Privy Council in this series, uh, Warnick, talking about the machinery of government. And I was struck by that conversation, Amanda, the extent to which, and, and I understand as a former clerk, he's he's part of a very elite club, and it's a club that you know uh, often speaks with one voice. I was surprised at the extent to which he felt that the status quo was um, not only adequate, but uh, up to and sufficient uh, to meet the, the kind of needs and challenges of the country. And I wonder if you were surprised also by that conversation, the extent to which it made me worry a little bit about an internal Ottawa voice that might not really understand the frustrations in the rest of the country, the extent to which people yep. are um, turned off government and want to hear that maybe the status quo isn't okay, that we need um, some pressure points on government. We need change. Uh, we can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you that the um, that Wernick certainly conveyed a sense of a belief in and optimism about the quality of work being done and the quality of worker, right? He's happy with the civil service. Now, what I would say, uh, one thought I have, and, I'm, and, and this is my own thought, so I don't know it for sure. My guess is that when you occupy his role, and you know, we should, of course, remember, um, listeners should remember, he's occupied many roles over his 40 odd years um, in Ottawa. So he's been inside the inner workings of the civil service. He gets it. He's worked with deputy PMs, um, and then he had the top job, top unelected job in the country. And his point, I, the big takeaway for me was there are good people in there. Um, there are people mm -hmm. who are innovative, who do want to work hard, and those are the ones you need to unleash. And so his, he talks about the learning software of government. His whole thing is, let's figure out, you know, if we're bringing in consultants, don't make that a political football. Ask the question, when is that appropriate? And could we be doing more? Is this an opportunity to say, do we need internal leadership or strategy or something that we're not giving our people because there are good people? And so I think it, the, the ring of truth for me, Rudyard, was, you know, anybody who's worked in a big organization and I'll, I'll, you know, pull on the CBC as an example, the bigger they are, the more likely they are to have people who you're not really sure what they're doing. Uh, they're kind of there, they're filling a desk, they're doing some small amount of work, but there are always also talented, hardworking, smart individuals. And in my experience, they find one another and have a lot of fun. And that was the analogy I always use is it's a stream running really quickly through a pond and they don't let the, the rest of the pond bother them. It's big and it's still, and who knows what's out there, but the stream's moving. Um, and I feel like that was sort of what I took from Warnick, that there are good people who work hard in government and we need to tap them. Now, counter argument, of course, would be, and Sean's had some experience, um, obviously in the inner workings of this stuff, how do you kind of like figure out what's in the rest of the pond and dig it out and make sure it's a little bit, because those are our tax dollars that we do get offended when they're, when they're abused. So I would say if Warnick had like a tilt, it was slightly more positive, but I think it's because you so rarely get that view uh, and he wanted to make sure it was brought out. But I just want to seize on um, both of your observations there. Cause I think there's a ton of insight and it comes back to this point of, of state capacity um, and maximizing 
um, the human capital that we have within our public service. You know, one of the things that strikes me, uh, Amanda and Rudyard, is that in recent years, we've seen as the size of government has grown, actually kind of counterintuitively, morale within the public service has seemingly declined. And I, I think there we need it. We do need to have a, a kind of hyper focus on um, the extent to which the rules that we've imposed on government, oftentimes with good intentions around accountability and transparency and the fact that, that it's a, a unionized work environment and so on, is actually um, disempowering people. It's, it's, it's not hand giving agency to the type of people you're talking about, Amanda, so that they, you know, if you're coming to the public service, there's a, a some of course are self-selecting because of job security or whatever, but a lot are self-selecting because they're public spirited. And so I, I why don't you talk a bit about, um, uh, you know, what you heard over the course of the series and what we can be doing better to sort of elevate and support those people who do want to make a difference and are incapable of making a difference. So, and I think you're getting at a bunch of really important issues here, and it may actually be, um, you know, ground for exploration and future uh, for future work. And that is uh, how we work and which jobs we're going to focus on um, to, at the expense of others is the future, right? Whether it's the way um, AI and other technologies will change our labor force. Uh, the, what I heard repeatedly from people, including, you know, Lisa Ray kicked off the series and so refreshing to hear somebody who believes in government, did it for the right reasons, but could could say, you know, kind of in an unjaundiced way, things are kind of broken. You know, it takes nine months and you realize that actually the bureaucracy is dragging its feet because they don't want to do the thing you asked them to do. That you heard a little bit of, that there are ways for people inside government to slow things down if they don't think it's the right thing to do. And, but, you know, remember that right thing is a politically elected representative asking for it. So that's a problem. Um, so I guess I would turn the question back to you guys and say, wouldn't it be great if, our government was the place where innovative thinking around which jobs do we keep, which jobs are, and how, how are we going to soft land people out of jobs that we don't need anymore? Um, and what does that process look like? What's a humane way to kind of figure that out? Because, um, you know, it was Sean's work on the, the extent to which government jobs was the job growth that this government was bragging about that led me to the hub in the very first place. Um, just <laughs> data that tells a story. And that's always the the most interesting to me kind of story to hear, which is just, it's just facts. Um, and so, yeah, to me, it's, and I did hear a little bit of that, like, let's dig in, let's make government the innovative place to figure out how we get more capacity, how we get efficiency. There's a human side to that, that government might be best suited to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the recent labor negotiations with the federal public service were interesting to the extent to which, um, I don't know, I try to look at things with a glass half full, but the extent to which the right to work from home, in a sense, is almost enshrined now in collective bargaining. Uh, those trends to me uh, suggest that there are bigger problems here in terms of the culture of government and its willingness to to innovate, to adapt, to become more responsive. Um, I don't know what you think, Sean, but again, I'm trying not to be too cynical here, but <laughs> you know, big organizations, whether the CBC government, certainly not the hub right now, they have interests. And those interests are often related around the acquisition of more resources, more prominence, more power, more influence. These are, to me, inherent characteristics of often big, large, complex things. And we understand that often with corporations. And sometimes I think we have too much cynicism towards corporations as being relentlessly self-interested, relentlessly bent on the acquisition of power. I think often, Sean, we give government a pass. We send, tend to think that those same drivers, those same organizational and institutional forces just aren't part of government because everyone is you know, publicly interested and you know, focused on the collective good. I'm not always sure that that unfortunately is the case. I worry about these broader currents that inform, um, you know, the massive entity that is the federal government in Canada. Yeah, James Buchanan won a Nobel Prize for his work on public choice economics, which he described as politics without romance. And I think what you're <laughs> what you're suggesting is that we need to look at the government without a kind of romantic eye. And I think, you know, that's why I 
we're so grateful for Amanda's series over the past several weeks, which really did sort of lift the hood uh, up, uh, including elected officials, non-elected officials, and and so on. I would just say that um, that I suspect the government needs to be prepared for greater scrutiny um, in the coming years, in large part because of some of the pressures and demands that I mentioned earlier, aging demographics, climate change, and so on. Um, yep. The, the scarcity of public fun, of public finance is going to become greater. I mean, just take the provinces for, for a second, uh, Amanda and Rudyard. Several Canadian provinces are presently spending something approaching 50 cents of every program spending dollar on health care. Um, yeah. uh, at, at some point, that becomes unsustainable, and it's just going to lead to greater questions about what government does well, what it does poorly, what should it do, what shouldn't it do, and I'm not sure to Rudyard's point that it's quite ready for that conversation that, you know, just as uh, just as we're speaking today, the government has announced a new exercise to identify $15 billion in efficiencies, which, you know, may or may not be a good idea. But, you know, it seems to me at this point, we need something more systematic um, rather than just a kind of weed whacking exercise that we have every five or 10 years or so that the government yep. gives us a, a bit of money back after kind of growing exponentially for the previous five or 10 years. Um, why don't you talk a bit about that, Amanda? Did you did you get a sense that there's openness to that kind of systematic scrutiny that that, that I'm talking about? Yeah, and I mean, it, to be to be fair, I think it does exist. And what I heard from people like Wernick um, is that it's a constant process actually inside government. To me, just it's an, a bit of an aside, but the whole public ask for 15 billion just that signals to taxpayers that there's money lying around in Ottawa, exactly. right? That there's just a lot of waste. And I think that's deeply unfair. And I think we all know as um, intelligent humans that if you have to cut 15 billion in a month, it's not gonna be the right stuff. It's gonna be um, big expensive long-term payoff stuff that we actually wish they wouldn't cut. But anyway, that's an aside. One of the debates that Wernick pointed to, and this is important is Inside Ottawa, there's a tension between the decentralized system where departments function as independent units and a much more centralized one where there is kind of the uh, an, an overarching um, of HR and finance and all of these functions that will bring everything together. And I do think that's an important uh, debate. It's a healthy one that's it is going on in circles in Ottawa for sure. I think that might be one that could get political teeth, you know, and if you had a a, a prime ministerial candidate um, or a finance minister who wanted to say, we're actually going to revamp how this works. And, you know, some of us would have maybe a, a tendency to lean one way or the other, um, but you could actually unleash some of these departments a little bit more than they are um, and find the efficiencies within them. Uh, and stop doing overlapping functions. I mean, I think there's a lot um, of that extra bureaucracy that comes from some of those functions and there's savings in that. So, but you know, things like Phoenix, the pay system that's been such a debacle, mm -hmm. that just sends a shudder through an organization like this, right? That's where you get kind of the layering in of, you know, better hire consultants, but instead of taking ownership of something and you better have five people's signatures on it so that you're not the only name on that document. And that does, that's unfortunate, right? Cause it's, uh, it can, and that happens in corporations all the time too. When you get a culture of, uh, of low risk of, uh, of an unwillingness to fail, you just suffer the cost of it. And in this case, of course, the bottom line is for the taxpayer, nobody else. Uh, yeah, my, could, yeah, go okay. ahead, Sean. I was just going to say, um, to, 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 to that point, um, in the 1990s, of course, the, the Gretchen led government, um, undertook a program review. Of course, it was focused on, um, the, the large bus budget deficit and growing concerns about, uh, the, the, the federal government's fiscal sustainability, but it wasn't a weed whacking exercise. It was comprehensive. The government got out of things. It transformed itself. And yep. it's 1995 is actually a long time ago. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one wonders if we need something like that. Just to put a fun point on it, guys, you know, the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is a federal agency that uh, in theory was was conceived after SARS to play a major role in international surveillance um, through a previous exercise like the one the government's about to undertake in the name of just finding some efficiencies um, eliminated its international surveillance function. Um, and so I, I do think there is a real risk if there's, if it's not systematic, if it's not comprehensive, it doesn't start from the premise um, that this isn't just about finding short-term savings. It's about reinvigorating state capacity 
uh, the Agreed. risk is it, it it actually could do more harm than good, kind of counterintuitive. Although we, what, what I would just add to that, Sean, is, you know, when you think back to what um, the Creche uh, Martin team did, um, it, it was one of the biggest um, empowering times for provinces. Fiscally hard, politically, yes. it paid off. Um, and really, yes. it was Prime Minister Harper who followed through and actually empowered provinces in new ways. And he gets sort of credit slash blame for that. <laughs> but the fiscal groundwork was laid by Prime Minister Cretchen, right? If you're going to push costs down, you better push power down and accountability down too. So, and the only reason I raise that is we, uh, the citizens of this country, should be aware that when fis so called fiscal decisions are made, they have deep, lasting policy and political ramifications. So we do need to be mindful, pay attention. It does make a difference what's happening. If I'm optimistic in a mischievous way, it's that I think there are real parallels now to the Christian era. We've just seen in the last little while, the uh, you know bond rates um, across the world in the United States and Canada surging to new highs in this mm -hmm. uh, cycle. Debt servicing costs in Ontario now equal uh, approximately the entire spending on K-12 to education in the province. Uh, federally, debt servicing is up to almost our total expenditures uh, annually on the Canadian military. Uh, I wonder, Amanda, if, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And I wonder if the future of government in some ways is a story of factors and forces that lie outside, exogenous shocks that come along and force change and require a system uh, to adapt. Um, I guess I, I, I just wonder if this ever happens uh, that horrible word organically, you know, yeah. from within, as opposed to you know, the Kretchen reforms, I don't think would have occurred if there hadn't been an acute uh, fiscal crisis, a crisis, you know, threatened the credibility of the Canadian dollar that called into question our ability to service our debt obligations. I do worry that Canada is one of the highest uh, debt to GDP on a per capita basis when you add in government uh, private debt, non-financial corporate debt. We're right up there above Greece behind only Japan on a per capita uh, debt basis. Wow, yeah. that's not a great place to be. I agree. I mean, one of my favorite sayings is the best thing about life is that you're graded on a curve. Um, but in this case, uh, you know, we may look better than some, but we're next to the United States. Um, there is a safe option right there for the world's uh, world's uh, investors. And I would add to your list there, if we're going to, um, you know, stir up concerns, as we transition away from, you know, that good stable source of revenue of oil and gas in this country, uh, that will create new fiscal realities. So, yeah, for all those years when we were told, it's different this time. And, you know, believe me, that was even by people like Paul Martin, um, who, who came around to it's OK to have this level of debt to GDP because, because, because um, we invented new policies, MMR, to help us find our way through it. Um, I think history does rhyme. I think we need to be quite careful about that, uh, because, as you say, it's not often an internal choice. It is usually forced upon us by some event or another. What might be a bit different this time, though, um is the changing media landscape. I was struck um, that this was something that Jason Kenney really zeroed in on um, mm -hmm. in talking about his experience as premier in Alberta, particularly around COVID. Um, his, his argument, uh, for those listeners, viewers haven't, haven't seen the episode, which I'd strongly recommend you check out, is that um, the decline of legacy media, in part for market reasons, in part because of trust reasons, has led to uh, the expansion of what one would call independent media or alternative media, something, you know, movement the hub, at, at least in theory, is part of. Um, but he said that it's it's having pretty profound effect on politics and, and policymaking. Why don't you just talk a bit about um, uh, that, Amanda? Yeah, and, and I mean, I really appreciated the candor that Jason Kenney brought to that conversation because this is, a, I, I mean, I think uh, we can call him a, a, a believer in the process. He's been political for, um, I think, the right reasons, and I think he's done it, you know, multiple federally and provincially. Um, and, you know, there was a time when you would have called Jason Kenney far right. I remember uh, that he represented the right of the right side of, the, of his party. And the thing that he's quite frank about is that he found himself not right enough. Um, he found himself being accused of being part of some, you know, Davos-led cabal of conspiracy of the East. Um, and, it, and it was a really, I think it was a really personally 
um, discomfitting situation for him because that's not where he lives. And you know, what I took away from it is yes, mainstream media, which has only itself to blame, of course, um, there's something else at foot, uh, a foot, I think, and that is because of social media and the way that it can be manipulated, uh, there's a loss of basic goodwill. Uh, there's a loss of kind of benefit of the doubt, which I think if any, if, if you take anything away from this series, I hope it's that. I hope people can listen to it mm. and actually hear um, that, you know, people mean well, including me. You know, there's, there's no agenda here. It's just people trying to get to the bottom of things and share information and you can take it, you can leave it, you can add to it, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, which is, you know, I think what the hub does too, right? It's just, there's, there's important stuff happening and we should talk about it. And to me, that was kind of Kenny's point was sort of, you know, all the goodwill he had generated through decades of public service um, with personal sacrifice involved and issue after issue of his bona fides laid out for people and a single issue, it was gone. It was gone. Um, and that's painful. That was, I think, probably personally painful. Well, just in our final moments, let's go around the horn and just um, leave listeners with uh, kind of concluding reflections. I think mine, and I really appreciated the, Amanda, the, the approach that you took to this is that I think we all agree, and we agree at the hub, that there's too much negative discussion of government, a kind of knee jerk. Um, I think at times kind of Americanized conversation, unfortunately, especially on the right in Canada, that all government is bad and we should just simply get rid of it. And I don't know, live as if it was the middle ages, <laughs> I guess we were, there were serfs and castles and, and dukes and duchesses. So, I mean, there's no move to freedom. I guess that's basically my point. We need a system to organize society. Government has pluses and minuses. Thankfully we have one in Canada, which is democratically accountable, relatively transparent, um, it, uh, unlike other governments around the world, we often get to see what it's doing and we get to see right into it to the, whether it's a clerk of a privy council appearing on a podcast or, you know, uh, a premier who's willing to share their thoughts. I think that's something positive about our culture. So I just hope that people take away from this series, a sense of nuance, right? That mm -hmm. when we're having a conversation about government, we have to approach this with some nuance. There's things that government does really well that frankly we don't want corporations doing because we don't want to introduce a profit motive into our relationships with the state and with each other there are some areas where profit is not what you should be pursuing you should be pursuing a collective common purpose through democratic institutions and publicly accountable institutions that yes can and should be more efficient i think that is key but I really did appreciate, Amanda, um, the contribution to this conversation because we need that nuance. We need that context. We have to move away from the black and white uh, Manichaean view of, you know, uh, homo economicus versus, I don't know what you call it, homo government. <laughs> um, what's your take, Sean? What, what were your final reflections on this uh, excellent series? Yeah, as someone who cares about government and public service, um, you know, my major takeaway is that there is a need to inject some kind of energy, some fresh ideas, fresh perspectives, institutionally and then um and then even at the human resource level you know um former clerk of the privy council michael warnick talked a bit about the relatively modest interchange program that the federal government currently runs with private sector executives and nonprofit executives coming in and out of out of the system and and he characterized it principally as giving people different perspectives um either those leaving government or those coming in but i think it's actually much more important about just injecting um, those perspectives and experiences into the system um, yep. that one of the consequences of a highly unionized uh, federal public service or provincial public service for that matter is it can become a bit closed. Um, and I think we're seeing some of the negative consequences of how closed that system has become. And so, you know, it seems to me um, increasingly the focus ought to be less on you know, should it be a percentage point more or less as a share of GDP? And how do we kind of enliven um, the, the public service so that it it brings forth the kind of energy and dynamism and ideas and people that can match um, the major challenges uh, our society faces from aging to climate change to a kind of evolving geopolitics? That's the big takeaway for me. And I'm so grateful 
uh, to Amanda and the guests for having kind of set that out so powerfully over the past several uh, past several weeks. Well, I think, uh, I mean, it's uh, it, it's been really refreshing for me to do this. Um, so thanks to the hub for doing it. Um, I, I would say, you know, if I had a takeaway on it, it's uh, there is definite work to be done, uh, but that Canadians can be, um, can, can I think we can be, uh, understand that we're ready to do it. In other words, we're well placed to make these changes. It's not that there aren't things that need to happen. There are a lot of things that should happen here. Um, but that this dance between our bureaucracy, bureaucracy and our, our political system, uh, which is so important, is um, both of them are, are robust. So uh, we, can, we can fix them and we can focus on how they interact in a way that just makes us stronger. Uh, and that's, to me, that's a, it's a very positive thing. Um, but we shouldn't shy away from looking at it. It's the most important service in the country. Uh, it is the most important thing that shapes how we live and how other people will come to us, you know, you go back to those global investors. Uh, and so it is, you know, if there's, they're getting up to anything in auto every day, I hope it's their own business and how they run it is at the top of the agenda is sort of what I take away, but mm -hmm. lots of reasons for me to feel good about that. And a reminder, you know, I tend to, to default to this. People aren't there to cause trouble and they're not there to be bad at their jobs. Most people want to do good uh, and produce something good. And I, I come away with kind of a sense that, you know, that's probably what we're, what we've got working for us. And that's a good thing. Excellent, Amanda. Well, thank you so much for taking this series under your wing. And also a big thank you to Amal Adder Guzman, our producer, for pulling it all together behind the scenes and um yeah urge uh listeners viewers to uh to check it out it's all on the hub triple w the hub.ca just simply search for amanda or uh, go to the dialogues page and scroll down to look for the installments uh in the series and on the website and on your favorite podcast platform so thank you again amanda great to have this conversation with you and to wrap up the series. And uh, I know you'll continue to be chatting with Sean every two weeks, sharing your thoughts on the intersection of kind of economics, the economy, business, and public policy. And uh, we really appreciate those insights too. So have a great day, guys. We'll talk again soon. Thanks, guys.